For centuries, people across New Jersey have alleged sightings and encounters with a horse-headed flying demon known as the Jersey Devil. Legend has it that in the dense woods of the New Jersey Pine Barrens, the creature has lurked within the shadows of the unending sea of pine trees for close to 300 years, with numerous Jerseyans having told and heard tales of this mythical beast stalking the Pine Barrens and terrorizing the local residents. With the head of a horse, the wings of a bat, and talons of an eagle, it is commonly believed that the demonic devil was the cursed child of a bewitched Quaker woman and escaped to the nearby bogs, where it could be heard wailing and hunting victims till this very day. Others describe a large humanoid with a horse head and large bat wings, and some describe it like that of a classic demon with a horned head, red skin, and forked tail. But regardless of appearances, all these wide variety of encounters have been attributed to the mysterious Jersey Devil. Welcome to Unknown History. In this episode, we will be examining the history of the Jersey Devil, starting with the origins of the legend and a history of recorded sightings, and finally an examination into some explanations for the creature and its impacts on the modern culture of New Jersey. The origins of the Jersey Devil legend are often debated with stories of strange creatures in the Jersey Pine Barrens stretching back to the time of the first Native American inhabitants of the region. The Lenape people who originally populated the Pine Barrens region believed that the area was inhabited by their forest god known as Imsing. They depicted the deity as a deer-like creature with leathery wings or a deer being ridden by a man. In order to appease the forest god, the Lenape would hold grand ceremonies honoring him in the center of the forest, which both fascinated and terrified the Europeans when they first arrived in the area. With many Quaker settlers of the area believing the Imsing was the devil himself. With its deer-like figure and leathery wings, it was likely ultimately incorporated into the idea of the Jersey Devil itself. Along with the inspiration from the Imsing, the clear origin point of the Jersey Devil myth is the folk story of a Pine Barrens resident named Jane Leeds, often referred to as Mother Leeds. As mentioned earlier, local legend states that Mother Leeds had 12 children and after discovering she was pregnant for the 13th time, cursed the child in frustration, declaring that the child would be the devil. Later that year, in 1735, it is said on a stormy night that Mother Leeds delivered her 13th child, who was born normal, without any ailments. However, shortly after being born, the child began to morph into a hideous creature with hooves, a horse's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. Growling and screaming, the child attacked everyone with its tail before flying up the chimney and heading into the Pine Barrens, never to be seen again. In some variations of the tale, Mother Leeds was supposedly a witch, and the child's father was the devil himself, with local clergymen subsequently attempting to exorcise the creature from the Pine Barrens to no avail. This story would prove so influential in the region prior to the early 1900s that the creature would be referred to as the Leeds Devil, or the Devil of Leeds, in either connection with the local Leeds family or the southern New Jersey town Leeds Point, which also bears the family's name. Some historians have claimed to have identified Mother Leeds as a historical person, Deborah Leeds, on the ground that Deborah Leeds' husband, Jaffet Leeds, named 12 children in the will he wrote in 1736. Deborah and Jaffet Leeds also lived in Leeds Point, which is now in Atlantic County, New Jersey, and is part of the Pines Barren region of New Jersey. Other historians theorize that the story of Mother Leeds, rather than being based on a single historical person, originated from the colonial southern New Jersey religio political disputes and gossip involving the historical Leeds family that would become subject of folklore and legend among the local population. These stories originate from the 17th century with English Quaker settlements in southern New Jersey near the Pine Barrens. When Daniel Leeds, a Quaker and royal surveyor for the British Crown, who was a prominent person of pre-revolution colonial southern New Jersey society, had become ostracized by his Quaker congregation after his 1687 publication of almanacs containing astrological symbols and writings. Leeds' fellow Quakers deemed the astrology in these almanacs as too pagan and blasphemous, and the almanacs were censored and destroyed by the local Quaker community. At this time, witchcraft was seen as a very real threat to many of the isolated settler communities of the American colonies. 
with censorship, banishment, and even executions not being uncommon as punishment for these offenses. As the famous Salem witch trials, which would occur in nearby Massachusetts only five years later, would clearly show. Despite these threats of censorship and possibly worse, Leeds continued to publish even more esoteric astrological Christian writings and became increasingly fascinated with Christian Gnosticism, mysticism, cosmology, demonology, angelology, and other forms of natural magic practiced by the Native American tribes of the region. In the 1690s, after his almanacs and writings were further censored as blasphemous and heretical by the Philadelphia Quaker meeting, Leeds continued to dispute with the Quaker community, ultimately converting to Anglicanism and publishing anti-Quaker tracts, criticizing Quaker theology, and accusing the Quakers of being anti-monarchists. In the ensuing dispute between Leeds and the Southern New Jersey Quakers over Leeds' accusations of witchcraft and heresy, Leeds was endorsed by the much maligned British royal governor of New Jersey at the time, Lord Cornbury who was likewise loathed among the local Quaker communities, with Leeds also beginning work as a counselor and royal surveyor in service to the Lord during this time. Considering Leeds a traitor for aiding the crown and a heretic for rejecting Quaker beliefs, the Quaker Burlington meeting of southern New Jersey subsequently declared Daniel Leeds as evil. In 1700, the local South Jersey Quaker community retaliated against Leeds' anti-Quaker tracts with their own tract, Satan's Harbinger encountered, which was a refutation of Leeds' previous track and accused him of working for the devil. Around a decade and a half later, during 1716, Daniel Leeds' son, Titan Leeds, would inherit his father's almanac business, which continued to use astrological content and eventually competed with Benjamin Franklin's popular Poor Richard Almanac series. The competition between the two men intensified when during 1733, Franklin satirically used astrology in his almanac to predict Titan Lee's death in October of that same year. Though Franklin's prediction was intended as a joke, at his competitor's expense no less, and a means to boost almanac sales, Titan Leeds was apparently offended at the death prediction, denouncing Franklin publicly as a fool and a liar. In response, the future founding father mocked Titan Leeds' outrage, and to further antagonize him, humorously suggested that Titan Leeds had in fact died in accordance with the earlier prediction, and was thus writing his almanacs as a ghost, resurrected from the dead, to haunt and torment Ben Franklin. Franklin continued to jokingly refer to Titan Leeds as a ghost, even after Titan Leeds' actual death in 1738. So with Daniel Leeds' blasphemous and occultist reputation and his pro-monarchy stance in the largely anti-monarchist colonial south of New Jersey, combined with Benjamin Franklin's ascension and popularity and his continuous depiction of Titan Leeds as a ghost, may very well have contributed greatly to the development of a local legend of a so-called Leeds devil lurking in the Pine Barrens. During 1728, Titan Leeds also began to include the Leeds family crest on the masthead of his almanacs. The Leeds family crest depicted a wyvern that stands upright on two clawed feet. Historians have noted how the wyvern on the Leeds family crest is quite similar to the popular descriptions of the Jersey Devil. The fearsome appearance of the crest also likely did not help with the increasing animosity among local South Jersey residents towards royalty, aristocracy, and nobility with whom family crests were associated, and possibly further promoted the legend of the Leeds Devil and the association of the Leeds family with devils and monsters. As time would pass, the legend would only grow in popularity and the Leeds Devil would become a notorious legendary monster and ghost story in the southern Pine Barren regions of New Jersey with an oral tradition of the Leeds Devil stories now being well established in the Pine Barren region for up to 150 years. Well before the more modern depiction of the Jersey Devil as well as the now pervasive Jersey Devil name, which would become truly standardized as they are now known today in their current form during a string of sightings in 1909. While references to the Jersey Devil do not appear in newspapers or other printed material until the 20th century, the Leeds Devil was indeed the origin point of the Jersey Devil myth, with many sightings occurring throughout the 18th and 19th century with the creature being spotted throughout the Pine Barrens region, frightening local residents and any of those brave enough to traverse the vast underdeveloped expanses of New Jersey's southern reaches. 
The first notable recorded sighting of the Jersey Devil would occur in the late 18th century, when while visiting the Hanover Mills works to inspect his cannonballs being forged, Commodore Stephen Decanter sighted a flying creature and fired a cannonball upon it, to no effect, the strange occurrence being widely reported in the region. Another and perhaps more famous early sighting of the creature was recorded by Joseph Bonaparte, the famous French general and Emperor Napoleon's brother. Joseph was King of Spain, but then had lost a war against the English during the Peninsular War, which forced him to step down from his throne. The then former king moved to live out the rest of his days in New Jersey. As Joseph had owned land in Bordentown, which borders the Pine Barrens, he had built a huge mansion in Bordentown, which was very similar to the country estates in France he was accustomed to, with manicured gardens and lavish parties. The property even had its own lake and a winding road that went through the heart of the forest. It would be here that Joseph would have his encounter with the Jersey Devil. There are several variations of the tale of his encounter. Some versions of the story recalling Joseph hunting the Jersey Devil upon hearing of the local legend and just so happening to have an encounter with the beast that greatly startled him. Other versions simply claim he was hunting on his property when he saw the creature and attempted to fire upon it before it flew away. One version states that in the winter he had decided to go hunting in the woods on his property when he then came across very strange tracks in the snow unlike any other animal he had ever seen before, looking like a donkey's hooves but with only two feet instead of four. Then suddenly he had heard a noise and turned around to see a huge creature with a horse's head and wings. It screeched and flew over his head into the thick forest never to be seen again. Despite the differing details surrounding Joseph's sighting, it is consistently reported that Joseph did encounter something on his property, with him telling everyone he knew, swearing that he had seen what was truly the Jersey Devil of legend. The next recorded sighting of the Jersey Devil would occur 20 years later, when it was blamed for several livestock killings and strange screams that could be heard throughout the woods, these attacks causing panic among many of the region's farmers. The next sighting of note would occur about half a century later, in 1887, with a local newspaper from the time describing a sighting of a winged creature referred to as the Devil of Leeds, allegedly spotted near the Pine Barrens and well known among the local populace of Burlington County, New Jersey. The newspaper contains an eyewitness account stating the following. Whenever he went near it, it would give a most unearthly yell that frightened the dogs. It whipped at every dog on the place. That thing, said the colonel, is not a bird nor an animal, but is the Leeds devil, and it was born in Evesham a hundred years ago. There is no mistake about it. I never saw the horrible critter myself, but I can remember well when it was roaming around Evesham Woods 50 years ago, and when it was hunted by men and dogs and shot at by the best marksmen there were in all of South Jersey, but none could kill it. There isn't a family in Burlington or any of the adjoining counties that does not know of the Leeds Devil and it was the bugaboo to frighten children with when I was a boy. This account helps confirm the long-running nature of the Devil legend in the Pines Barren region. After the Burlington sighting and interview, about two decades later, now in the 20th century, the most infamous string of sightings and reports in the history of the Jersey Devil would occur during the Week of Terror between January 16th and January 23rd, 1909. Early in the week, reports began to slowly emerge from all across the Delaware Valley and Pines Barren regions of eerie screams and strange tracks from animals that could not be identified being found in the snow. The mysterious footprints would over and under fences, through fields and yards, and even across the rooftops of houses. Reports also appeared in large cities of Camden and Philadelphia, far from the dense forests of the Pine Barrens. As the sightings increased, fear and panic began to spread throughout the region, with posses and gangs of men even forming in smaller towns to drive the creature out. The fear and intrigue grew even greater when it was reported that bloodhounds refused to follow the unidentified creature's trail in Hamilton. The unease was so great that many schools outright closed or suffered low attendance throughout the lower New Jersey and Philadelphia areas. Sawmills and logging operations in the Pine Barrens also were forced to close early and open later when workers refused to travel through the woods when it was dark out to get to and return from their jobs. Eyewitness reports have even placed sightings of the beast in Camden and in Bristol, Pennsylvania, and in both cases, the city's police forces had fired upon the creature in an attempt to bring it down to no avail. 
A few days later, it would reappear in Camden, attacking a late night meeting of a social club, where it then shortly afterwards flew up and disappeared into the night sky. Earlier that same day, the creature had reportedly appeared in Haddington Heights, terrorizing a trolley car full of passengers before flying away. Witnesses claimed that the creature looked like a large flying kangaroo. Another trolley car full of people also claimed to have spotted the creature in Burlington when it scurried across the tracks in front of the car. In West Collingswood, it was also sighted on the roof of a house and was described by witnesses as a horrible-looking ostrich-like creature. Local firemen responded to the sighting and turned their hose upon the creature, where it then apparently attacked them and flew away. In addition, during this week of sightings, people had reported their livestock, particularly their chickens, being slaughtered en masse across the region. This was most severe in the towns of Bridgeton and Camden. Eventually the sightings would slow down, however, and the last sighting in the Week of Terror would occur when the creature reappeared later in the week, when a local woman found the beast attempting to eat her dog. She hit it with a broomstick, and it flew away, not to be seen again for many, many years. This string of sightings was played up in the media at the time, and would be the first documented incident where the creature would be referred to as the Jersey Devil instead of the Leeds Devil. The new name stuck, and it would ultimately become most well known under this name, but at the time, both names were still widely used and often interchanged, as they both referred to the same creature. It would be around two decades later, in 1927, when the next major sighting of the Jersey Devil would occur, when a local cab driver got a flat tire in the middle of the night in Salem City, New Jersey. He got out of the car to change the tire, but then suddenly, the Jersey Devil emerged from the woods, screaming and heading straight for him. The driver, now terrified, scrambled back into his car, with the Jersey Devil now pounding on the roof of the vehicle, trying to break in. However, as soon as the attack had begun, it was over and the scratching had stopped and the creature seemingly had disappeared into the night. The driver was able to safely leave the area. The taxi driver would report the incident to the police, claiming that he saw the Jersey Devil and recalling his harrowing encounter. However, nothing would ever come of the report and the Jersey Devil would remain at large. Nearly five decades later, in 1972, a sighting of the creature would occur on Green Tree Road, a long winding road that runs through several towns in the south of New Jersey. A woman named Mary Christensen was leaving the town of Blackwood and heading towards Glassboro when she spotted the creature crossing the street in her rear view mirror of her car. She stated the creature was roughly 25 feet away from the rear of her car and described it as having a head of a horse and woolly haunches with hooves for feet and it was standing upright like a man and had a huge set of leathery wings on its back. Christensen told everyone she knew about the creature she spotted that night and her story would end up being published in Weird New Jersey magazine. Around a decade later, in the 1980s, an incident would occur in Wharton State Forest, which is located in the heart of the Pine Barrens. The chief forest ranger named Alan McFarlane was called out to a South Jersey farm near the forest. The entire herd of the farmer's pigs had been brutally slaughtered in the middle of the night. The back of each pig's head having been eaten, as if something perched on their backs and ripped into them, it then leaving the rest of the body untouched, before moving on to the next animal in the herd. In all his years of experience, Chief McFarland had never seen such a ghastly scene and was baffled by it. The mystery would remain unsolved, however the locals believed without a doubt that the only possible explanation to this case is that the Jersey Devil must have carried out the brutal attack. In 1993, a forest ranger named John Irwin was inspecting the Mullica River, which runs through the heart of the Pine Barrens. He was driving his patrol route when he had to stop his car because there was a huge animal in front of the road, which he at first thought was a black bear. But to his horror, as he looked more closely, he realized it had horns like the devil and stood over six feet tall. Irwin and the creature stared at each other for several minutes. He did not dare move his car, afraid that it may attack him. After their staring contest was over, the creature slipped back into the forest and was never seen by him again. In 2015, on Route 9, which is one of the major roads that runs alongside the Pine Barrens, there was a sighting that is included in the Weird New Jersey book that occurred from someone going by the name Sonny, not wanting to give his full name to avoid ridicule. He reported that it was around 10 p.m. at night while driving through the town of Bayville when two cars driving ahead of him had suddenly slammed on their brakes and then a disgusting creature had emerged from the woods into his view. 
he described it as being hairless with a strange and unsettling set of short ears and hooved feet. He also said it towered over the road, standing nearly 10 feet tall, him thinking it had to be the infamous Jersey Devil he had heard about growing up. But by the time he had realized what he was looking at, it had galloped across the highway out of sight. While telling the story to his friends and family, they insisted that what he most likely saw was just a deer with mange. But he insisted that he had seen plenty of deer driving at night before, and this was absolutely no animal he had ever seen. Nevertheless, he never saw the creature again, and still does not know exactly what he saw that night. In that same year, another person also claimed that they thought they saw the Jersey Devil along Route 9 in Egg Harbor Township near a golf course. The witness, David Black, described the creature like a giant llama, which was standing inside of a fence along the roadway until suddenly it whipped out a gigantic pair of wings and started flying away right over the road. David Black grabbed his cell phone and tried to capture a video of the baffling creature, the video clip being very short and what seems to show Jersey Devil flying across the screen as a black silhouette against a colorful sunset. There is a still photo of the same creature that is attributed to this clip and looks like a horned goat with wings. The photo has subsequently become the most famous modern day evidence of the Jersey Devil's existence despite heavy scrutiny. The clip was released on the internet close to Halloween of that same year, which subsequently caused many people to believe that David Black had staged the incident as a hoax. He told NewJersey.com, I swear it's not photoshopped or staged. People have said it's fake, but it's not. I am honestly just looking for an explanation for what I saw. However, no one else has ever come forward to testify to being with him during the encounter and to seeing a similar creature, so all credibility of the incident depends on the belief in Black's testimony and the credibility of the video footage. And while not being definitive, the sighting did cause quite an uproar in the local New Jersey area and across the internet, Black's sighting being the latest noteworthy sighting of the Jersey Devil and the creature's long storied history, which as we have examined, goes back for centuries. But what are some explanations for these sightings? While believers in the creature believe it to be an unknown species of animal, or perhaps a supernatural entity, skeptics believe the Jersey Devil to be nothing more than a creative manifestation from the imaginations of the early English settlers in South Jersey, with plausible explanations including stories created and told by bored Pine Barren residents as a form of children's entertainment and ghost story, the byproduct of historical local disdain for the Leeds family, the misidentification of known animals, and ill-mannered rumors based on common negative perceptions of the local residents of the remote Pine Barrens regions. The frightening reputation and haunting vastness of the Pine Barren forests may have indeed contributed to the Jersey Devil legend. Historically, the Pine Barrens was considered inhospitable land, with gangs of highwaymen, such as the politically disdained loyalist brigands, known as the Pine Robbers, being known to rob, attack, and even kill travelers passing through the Barrens. During the 18th and 19th centuries, residents of the isolated Pine Barrens were deemed the dregs and outcasts of society, with this including poor farmers, fugitives, brigands, Native American tribes forced into hiding, poachers, moonshiners, runaway slaves, and deserting soldiers, all who would have reasons to want to remain hidden and could be dangerous to outsiders. The residents may have even fostered and encouraged certain frightening tales about themselves and the Pine Barrens region as a whole in order to discourage outsiders or intruders from daring to enter the Barrens. Local residents of the Pine Barrens were further demonized and vilified after two eugenic studies were published during the early 20th century, which depicted locals as congenital idiots and criminals as seen in the research performed in the Kalikak family by Henry H. Goddard, which is now considered biased, inaccurate, unscientific, and most likely falsified. Due in part to their isolated and undeveloped nature, the Pine Barrens have themselves fostered a variety of various folk legends other than the Jersey Devil, including supernatural creatures and ghosts said to haunt the forests. This includes the ghost of famous pirate captain James Kidd, who supposedly buried treasure in the Pine Barrens and is also sometimes allegedly seen in the company of the Jersey Devil. The ghost of the Black Dog, the ghost of the Golden-Haired Girl, the spirit of the sea, who dressed in white, mourns the loss of her lover at sea, and the white stag, a ghostly white deer said to rescue travelers who become lost in the barrens. There are also folk tales concerning the blue hole, an unusually clear blue and rounded body of water 
located in the Pine Barrens between Monroe Township and Winslow Township, and it's often associated with the Jersey Devil. The fact that ghost stories and folk tales are so common in the region leads skeptics to believe the Jersey Devil, taking some inspiration from the local Leeds family, may ultimately have been a creation of Pine Barren residents used to scare outsiders away. And while this theory explains the origins of the creature, it does not explain the wide variety of sightings of the creature that would initially occur within the region, but then would spread to many other parts of New Jersey and other nearby states that were not closely located to the Pine Barrens region. In the case of sightings of the creature, many skeptics point to the misidentification of known animals. The most common of these being large owls, eagles, black bears, bobcats, and perhaps even mountain lions, which while no longer inhabitants of the eastern United States, there may have been small populations in the area during the time of early colonial settlements. All of these animals, especially in the dark and foreboding primeval forests throughout the state during the early colonial period, would have been more than capable of carrying out the attacks on livestock and pets that were often attributed to the Jersey Devil at the time. The arboreal nature and climbing ability of black bears and big cats, along with owls and eagles, large wings and talons, and the wyvern-like features of the Leeds family crest, would have all been combined into the fearsome Jersey Devil, which was able to easily fly and disappear back into the canopy of the forest after its attacks. It can also be theorized that the eerie vocalizations of owls and mountain lions may have also contributed to the stories about the Jersey Devil's frightening screams, and that stories of the Jersey Devil describing it as a humanoid-like figure with dark fur may have been inspired by sightings of black bears standing on their hind legs, which while being obscured in the darkness of the forests would make it understandable for someone to believe they were seeing the legendary Jersey Devil itself. Jeff Brunner of the Humane Society of New Jersey also believes the Sandhill Crane is partially the basis of the Jersey Devil, with their appearance closely matching the general descriptions of earlier sightings of the creature, and its loud vocalizations being able to explain the creature's characteristic unsettling scream that is featured in many stories. Outdoorsman and author Tom Brown Jr. spent several years living in the wilderness of the Jersey Pine Barrens. He recounts an occasion where he terrified hikers after they mistook him for the Jersey Devil when he had covered his whole body in mud to repel the swarms of mosquitoes that plagued the area in the summers. Medical sociologist Robert E. Bartholomew and author Peter Hassel cites the infamous 1909 Week of Terror series of sightings of the Jersey Devil and the subsequent public panic as a classic example of mass hysteria begun by a regional urban legend. The panic was likely driven on by the rival newspapers of the region at the time competing with each other to release the most sensational stories about the creature possible while the public was interested and fearful of the creature as a way to drive sales. This causing the sightings to be increasingly sensationalized and in some cases apparently fabricated outright. These fabrications and hoaxes of sightings being the other point of argument used by skeptics as an explanation for sightings of the creature. The most famous case of these sort of hoaxes being shortly after the Week of Terror, when on January 24, 1909, an ad from a struggling dime museum on 9th and Arch Streets in Philadelphia appeared in a local paper announcing that the captured Leeds Devil would be put on display. A follow-up story was then written by a local reporter who was in on the scheme, where he then reported that thousands had turned out to see the fuming and fretting creature chained up in a cage. However, as it would turn out, the Jersey Devil that appeared at the museum was no monster at all, but a cleverly disguised kangaroo, one that, despite its intent, did not save the museum or fool many. It remained displayed for only a few weeks before the display was unceremoniously ended. Years later, the local reporter, whose name appears as Jeffries in newspaper clips, confessed to staging the stunt. When he died at the age of 67, the Philadelphia Inquirer would report him as saying, Reports that the Jersey Devil had reappeared aroused his showmanship instinct, and he used all the arts of a press agent to build up belief in the legend. And while this case is the most prominent known example of a confirmed hoax involving the Jersey Devil, there is undoubtedly many more that have never been uncovered, with even the most famous encounter in recent years being the David Black photo and footage being under heavy scrutiny for being a hoax. 
So while many of the alleged sightings of the Jersey Devil may be genuine, it cannot be ruled out that some of those sightings could be hoaxes or fabricated entirely, either for monetary gain or attention, or perhaps both. In an attempt to remedy this problem, one New Jersey group called the Devil Hunters, who refer to themselves as official researchers of the Jersey Devil, devote time to collecting reports, visiting historic sites, and going on nocturnal hunts in the Pine Barrens in order to find physical evidence and definitive proof that the Jersey Devil does in fact exist. And while there has not been another sighting event that matches the frequency, fervor, and intensity of the week-long January 1909 Week of Terror, there continues to be a steady stream of minor reports year to year of encounters with the Jersey Devil. Most often, people report finding strange, unidentifiable tracks in sandy soil and desolate areas of the Pine Barrens. Some claim that they are the footprints of strange birds, others saying they closely resemble hoof prints, although whatever it is, it walks on two legs. And while less frequent, there are still occasional reports of people who have allegedly seen more than just tracks, and managed to catch a glimpse of the creature itself. These continued sightings showing that belief in its existence that as we have detailed has been occurring for hundreds of years has continued, with the creature still maintaining relevance in the consciousness of the New Jersey public. This being made self-evident not only by commentators who elaborate on the possibility of the creature's existence, but also by the creature's appearance in investigative TV programs, such as Mother Leads 13th Child, In the Search of Monsters, and lore and monsters and mysteries in America. The tale of the Jersey Devil has also spread beyond the Pine Barrens and has become embraced by all of New Jersey, even to the point where it has been largely normalized and commercialized. The Jersey Devil is now portrayed in toys, on t-shirts, and is even the subject of its own feature film. It was also used as a theme for a Six Flags Great Adventure roller coaster, and most famously of all, the Jersey Devil has lent its name to New Jersey's NHL hockey franchise. And while most Jerseyans see the Jersey Devil as nothing more than a quaint figment of collective imagination and a source of unification and pride and a unique and important piece of New Jersey culture and history, a few others see it as a very real creature. However, those who swear they do not believe in the existence of the Jersey Devil may have their minds changed after just spending one moonlit night in the Pine Barrens. There, where a ghostly mist drifts across the cedar swamps, and the unearthly cry of some unseen creature can be heard piercing the still dark air of the near impenetrable pine forest, few disbelievers can be found. But whether it's deep in the Pine Barrens, or deep in the collective unconscious of the people of New Jersey, one thing is certain, the Jersey Devil still lurks in New Jersey, and most likely, always will.